Citation laureates are researchers whose Nobel level work has changed our world. This year, Clarivate has named 22 new citation laureates in the fields recognized by the Nobel Prize. I'm Rebecca Cranville from Clarivate, and today we are privileged to have with us Dr. Anne M. Graybeal, a renowned neuroscientist based at MIT, whose exceptional research has earned her this esteemed recognition. Dr. Graybill, thank you for being here with us. Oh, and thank you for having me. It's a great honor. And an honor to uh, be cited along with Okihisa Hikusaka and Wolfram Schultz. Now, your pioneering work together with your colleagues is on the brain's basal ganglia has significantly advanced our understanding of neural circuits and their role in behavior and disease. Your contributions have profoundly impacted the field of neuroscience. So I'm very keen to understand from you what sparks your passion in your work. Uh, I think it's somehow inside me to be excitable. And uh, I must say, uh, I have an advantage that's, you know, it's my privilege. I, I come from a family of people who cared about medicine and science. My father was both. Um, my mother should have been a, just a little bit too early for women in Northern Ireland to become doctors, but um, they, they were wonderful. And uh, that, that certainly was a good start for any, any kid, for that matter, any grown up. And uh, I fell in love with just learning, learning about things, being excited about things. I, I love the act of, or the process of discovery. Uh, it has its true ups and downs, you know, but uh, that's all right. But I'm, how can I put it? I was very, very, very lucky because I was cranky along. I wanted to be a chemist. Well, actually, first, I wanted a trajectory that would start with very basic stuff of uh, math and physics and then go chemistry, then go biology, then go philosophy. And uh, I got stuck on biology and then I somehow had already developed an interest in the brain. How, who could not be interested in the brain, right? So, but we didn't know how to study it. Anyway, one of the sparks was that, gee, we began to learn a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Then I wanted to use the chemistry I knew to study the human brain, but there was no way to do it long before imaging, because this is a long time ago, I'm 100 years old. So what happened was I decided I would use if I could, neurochemical staining in experiment on experimental animals. And if I could see something out of that experiment, I could then use that neurochemical and try to find that result in the brain. That sounds crazy. But I used something that was really pretty interesting. It's so inspiring and it really is a remarkable journey that you've been on. And so it's great to hear those different parts of that path and, and what feeds your passion for what you do, which is which comes across very clearly. Thank you. The other thing that I would like to ask, another question for you is, um, what have you learned from the challenges that you faced? Challenges. <laughs> um, life has challenges for most of us. It's amazing, there are a few people for whom it just seems, everything seems to work. But I think for most of us, you know, we have those times, those years, those experiences that are tough, and I've had them. Um, as I said, I'm 100 years old, not quite, but <laughs> um, so I was, you know, I'm female, and um, gee, I never saw a female professor when I was in college. I went to Harvard. Um, I was for some time on a, in a sixth floor building at MIT, I was the only female professor or young professor. Uh, all the meetings, I often was the only one. But anyhow, 
Um, I learned it's a, it's a good idea to try to be oneself. I think on the women's front, I've had a number of students, and of course I am me, and I think one of the most difficult things for women has, was anyway, to become confident because, you know, you're surrounded by a lot of confident people. And I'm, I think one of the things that pleases me the most and may be a good side of my having challenges is that I've nurtured people and I've seen people turn from young women from uh, definitely underconfident to just, you know, blazing out. So this is really good. This is really good. I have one last question for you. Okay. Um, I would love to know which qualities do you think you need to become a great researcher? And is there any other advice that you would like to offer young researchers today? <laughs> oh, am I that wise? Um, I want them to know that in doing research, it's often the case that you follow a trail, follow a trail, and then it, it's a dead end, or somehow you don't think it works. Maybe later it does, but not right now. And then you've lost you know, X amount of time where it can be part of a thesis time, or it can be you know, three years of your career. It can be whatever. You have to be very careful to know when to kind of stop when or put it aside and say, I swear, I, I promise myself, I'll come back to it later. But meanwhile, can I find something where I really can make some kind of advance? I think that's going to be important, especially now, because now, oh my goodness, it's uh, there's a kind of fierceness about the competition that's... Uh, grown. I guess we're competitive by, by nature and we've always, you know, there's always been competition. Our field, there famous competition between a man named Golgi and a man named Kahal, um, <laughs> Nobel people, uh, founders of our field. But gosh, it's ruthless right now. And it's very international. But I think really uh, it's probably critical to find what you like to do, what, what turns you on, so to say, and then to really go for it. Then you should have the feeling, this is what I want to do. And you do feel passionate because you, you, know, you chose it as something you wanted to do. You didn't just look up, you know, the... 15 most famous guys and what they do and then, you know, go to number one and do what he does. So some people want to do molecular biology. Uh, some people don't want to do that at all. They want to do something entirely different, study flowers. This is great, right? But they have to care, right? They have to care. And then they must be resilient. It's not the greatest word in in the whole world, in my opinion. But they must have some kind of ability to, to stick it out when there are long droughts. You know, when I did my, started my PhD work in the field I eventually went into, um, my second year, the first 23 experiments didn't work. But the 24th worked. <laughs> and that ended up being my thesis, right? So that's good. Uh, it helps when you have friends uh, who are in the same boat or who care, or elders who are, I mean, I've had some amazingly inspirational professors and teachers who weren't professors, teachers about life. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. Just want to say you're very welcome. I, you you did invite me to answer difficult questions, but I I do appreciate your having me, and I'm very honored.
and uh, hope I can see you again, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Graybeal. It's been fascinating to learn more about your thank inspiring you. work in neuroscience and the impact that you've had on our world, your inspirations, your passions. So thank you. Thank you. Anne Graybeal has been recognized as a Citation Laureate 2024 alongside Wolfram Schultz at the University of Cambridge and Okihide Hikosaka at the National Eye Institute at the National Institutes of Health. If you'd like to find out more about the Citation Laureates, visit our website at clarivate.com slash citation laureates. <laughs>